Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, on the defense, how Australian animals protect themselves. Presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Nikki Centinella. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Nikki. Hi there. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am really thrilled to dive into this topic. Uh, I know a few people were looking out for this one uh, last month or so, and unfortunately, I was a bit sick, so I'm ready to dive back into this um, and explore some of the defensive strategies that our uh, Australian animals have. There are a lot of defense mechanisms that species use all over the world. And I wanted to show you some of the weird and wonderful ones, as well as to give a little bit of context on how animals do defend themselves and why, and why they'd rather do the bare minimum than try and do something really costly. And I think when we think of Australian animals, we straight away go to the venomous ones and I'll definitely be touching straight on them. Um, but there's a lot of different strategies that our animals use. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to introduce myself. If you uh, haven't seen any of my webinars before, uh, my name is Nikki Centinella. I am Australian. I am currently presenting from the lovely Vancouver in Canada. Uh, and I've been living in Canada for two years as well. So this is my two states of being really, where I switch between my Australian no shoes beach loving self and then nice and rugged up I've actually just come back from Churchill Manitoba where I've been guiding our polar bear season so uh, all over the place when I'm not guiding I am a conservation biologist as well so I do a lot of research including in a lot of areas around Australia uh, I'll talk a couple of those projects as well um, so I've seen some of these defensive strategies up here and uh, up nice and close and personal as well uh, and I think like all of us, keen naturalist, a uh, bit of a bookworm, and you might pick up some Aussie slang as well, but I've been working on my North American R's, so <laughs> we'll see how we go. I might switch to Canadian every now and again too. Uh, so some of the defense strategies I wanted to dive in today, uh, there's a lot of different ways to defend yourself from, normally we're talking about predation, but this could be from competition from others of the same species, um, and it could just be from the unknown as well. So I think some of the common ones that we think about are often venom, um, especially when we talk in an Australian context. Uh, but there's other things like camouflage. If I can blend in and not be seen at all, that's going to be uh, a great way for me to conserve my energy and also not be threatened. Uh, things like color, size, physical changes the way that bodies present themselves, as well as behavioral adaptions to uh, being defensive. So I'm gonna to touch on a few of these as we move through some species that uh, we see in Australia and get to know them a little bit better. But why do we have defense strategies? The obvious ones are I don't wanna be eaten for dinner. So if I can avoid being eaten for dinner, then I can live out the rest of my life and, and defending against that is a pretty real risk when you're uh, a species in a really complex environment like a lot of the places, the wild places we like to visit. Uh, so there's that. There's also competition like I was talking about and just unknown threats as well. So really just being on guard. I, often when we as humans, as a species, go into a new space and other species may not have interacted with us before, uh, we're going to see some of those defensive strategies. And I think it's really important for us to recognize that as travelers and visitors to wild spaces so that we can respect those animals because they're trying to tell us that, hey, I'm not comfortable in this situation. If we can avoid any conflict, then we don't have to get to anything more extreme, like say something like venom or any attacks like that. So reading defensive strategies can be a really good way uh, to show respect for the places that we're in. Uh, the risk of harm is also gonna affect how defensive an animal is going to be if it's not really feeling that threatened from a smaller species or um, potentially um, an individual of their same species that's approaching, then the strategies will change. And I think the really big one as well is how much energy does it take to stay safe? When I think about a lot of species in interacting in the world, I think about uh, where that energy comes from. 
energy really is what making everything move and live and controls how much we want to eat and then what we do with that energy, how much uh, of that is coming through that food web and continuing. And so energy is is like a, a finite resource that a lot of these creatures have. Um, I was just in Churchill watching polar bears conserve that energy. So when they're waiting for that ice, that's where their food is. But when they don't have that food source, they're going to conserve that energy so that they can uh, make sure that they have that when they need to go and hunt and when they need to defend themselves. So there's different layers of defensive strategies and we'll, we'll duck into this a little bit. But something passive like camouflage, if I can just blend in, then I don't actually have to do anything more than just be me uh, and I'm a little bit safer versus some of the active strategies that we'll dive into. So these are just some of the things I want you to consider and think about when you think about the motivation behind an animal trying to defend themselves. So I'm going to touch on venom because I think the most common thing I get asked uh, being overseas when people talk about Australia is that everything will kill you. And there are a lot of venomous creatures in, in Australia, uh, but they don't want to use it. So I'm going to quickly just dive into the definition. Uh, venomous, poisonous gets thrown around a little bit. Very simply, uh, if it bites you and you die, then it's venomous. If you bite it and you die, then it's poisonous. So you can think of eating a poison mushroom. That's going to be poisonous versus a snake or a spider biting you. That's going to be venomous. I think the thing to consider when uh, you think about venom and you think about uh, snakes and spiders particularly trying to defend themselves, they don't want to use their venom on you. Venom is really hard to produce. It takes a lot of metabolic energy to make that venom. They can only really sustain up to about 0.5% of their body mass of venom before it becomes really, really costly to produce that. And so if they don't have to use it, they won't. I think the most common example we think of is maybe rattlesnakes. Uh, you think of rattlesnakes and they have this really loud rattle to let you know they're feeling threatened and they don't want to have to resort to using their venom. And that's a development that they've developed, right? They've, they've developed all of this energy to build a rattle just to let you know so they don't have to use their venom. And it shows you how much more costly that venom is. And I think we think about this as well with uh, spiders. Uh, we think of the black widow and the red back spider. They uh, both have this flash of red on a very, very black abdomen. That color is a warning to us not to interfere with that animal because if we interfere with that animal, there is going to be a cost and they're just trying to defend themselves. They really want to use this venom for prey. And so when we think about that cost of energy to make that venom, they need to get a feedback from that. So they need to use their expensive venom to catch food so that they can replenish that energy. And so when we think about it from that purpose and we think about us as big human beings that we are compared to a little snake or a spider, uh, they don't want to use that against us. Uh, and they're going to give us as many warning signs as they can uh, so that they don't have to waste that venom on us. We see this with scorpions as well, um, as well as snakes and spiders. They'll sometimes use a dry bite. And so this is really already, they've maybe flashed, shaken a rattle or flashed some color and still there's a threat. They may even just do a bite without any venom so that you get a pain response, but they're not wasting that venom. And again, it really shows that it's the last resort that they don't want to use that venom. Um, now, I am going to show you a little snake. So if anyone doesn't want to see some snakes, then look away for the next two minutes and then there's no more snakes or spiders in my presentation. Uh, but this little snake is a mustard belly snake. This mustard belly snake is like a large shoelace. They're not very long, maybe get up to a bit over a foot. And they're quite skinny. Uh, they have this beautiful band on the back of their head. And then you can see underneath this snake is rearing up. You can see this mustard color underneath. Now this mustard color, this is a really common pose that we think of snakes before they strike. And this is them trying to say, hey, I'm feeling threatened. I'm in an aggressive mood. Don't come any closer. And often they'll have this brighter color underneath and it'll flash that color 
again, as a warning sign to say, hey, back off. And so if we give our snakes some space, then they're more likely to move off. Um, I spent my summer, two summers ago, uh, looking out for these guys after the bushfires in Australia and looking at how they recovered. And they've come back really, really well. And so I was actively looking for these guys. I was doing everything you're told not to do as a kid, which is look through the leaf litter and flip all the logs and the ro rocks. Uh, and I still didn't find that many and I never had uh, a predatory or aggressive behavior to me. They always will just move off. Generally, we find them sleeping because they like to be active at night. And so I'll, I'll look at them, I'll record that I've seen one, I'll back away. We both move on with our lives. So as someone actively looking for them, you know, it gives me a lot of confidence when I move through this space that if we just give each other space, we're going to move off from that. So that's our lovely uh, mustard belly snake. Now, another creature you may not expect to have venom, which actually doesn't use it for hunting prey, so using it for a different reason, uh, is our platypus. So our platypus is a monotreme, and a monotreme is a mammal that lays eggs. Uh, if you want to have a look at some of the past webinars, I did talk about all the mammals, marsupials, and monotremes in Australia. Uh, so this is the lovely platypus when it was first sent across to England by the settlers when they came, they thought it was a joke. They thought someone stitched a bunch of animals together and they were looking for bits of thread. Um, it is a curious creature and they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, they will rummage through the bottom of riverbeds and look for small invertebrates, uh, little insect larvae, things like that. So they don't need venom to hunt. They actually have a little venom spur on the back of their back leg and it's really pronounced and it's active on males. Now because we only see it on the males, we think that that is because it is for a male competition when they're competing for access to females. So they don't use it for hunting, they're not going to use it as a defensive strategy, but they're going to have that venom gland for competition with other, mammal, uh, other males. Uh, so it just depends on the species what they're going to use that for, but they're going to use it just for that one application. Usually it's prey, but for the platypus, it is uh, for that competition. So I wanted to take you under the surface, uh, talk about a couple of marine environments where we see some of these defensive strategies and how we don't use that venom as much as possible. We do have a little octopus who I think is very cute. <laughs> um, and I wanna see if you guys can spot it in this picture. There is a small octopus in there. I know what I'm looking for, so I find it a little bit easier to spot, but it is right in the center of this image. In that little pool of water, there is a small octopus tucked into this tiny, tiny little uh, pocket of the intertidal zone. These guys are one of the first things that I learn about when I'm a kid growing up on the beaches of Sydney. Uh, and that's to make sure that we're not stepping into little holes and crevices in case these guys are, are lurking there. These guys are what we call generally the group of blue ringed octopus. In the Sydney region where I grew up, we call them the blue lined octopus is the specific species uh, where we see them. And they look like this. They're pretty beautiful. Uh, they are very small and they're very shy. And so their actual main defense is to not be seen at all. So we can see that camouflage in this first photo where it is right in the center tucked into that pool. I can just see the top of its head, a couple of tentacles down below. And then they'll use their next defense, which is behavioral, and they'll try and move away. So if they can sense a large threat, it's not food, it's not anything they want to deal with, they will slink away as quickly as they can. They're really quite hard to see. Um, but if it then feels like they're trapped, there's nowhere else for them to go, then they'll start to flash these beautiful blue lines or these blue rings. And these are really, really bright. Um, they can sort of, they almost look like they're moving the way that they iridesce and they change the physical structure of their skin in order to display this really bright color, uh, kind of like a cuttlefish. And so this is a massive warning. Blue is not something that we see often in nature and blue is a really common color uh, that warns of poison or of venom. It is often used, we think of like poison dart frogs, we think about um, obviously our uh, blue-lined octopus and also some lizards we'll look at in a moment as well. 
but blue when we think of natural pigments in the environment is not very common. We see some birds with blue, they'll often use uh, the physical structures of their feathers to create the effect of blue, but it doesn't have the pigment naturally in it. It's actually just the light refracting. So blue is a pretty primal response in a lot of animals to say this is something different and different could be dangerous. Uh, we also do see some animals that will mimic blue. And they will also display blue, even though they don't have the venom to back up their threat. Uh, and this sort of mimicry we see in a lot of different species as a defensive structure, where if it works that everyone who has blue doesn't get eaten because they have venom, maybe if I have blue and I pretend I have venom, then I also won't get eaten. So we start to see these copycats come through in nature as well, which I think is a, a really clever strategy and it's a way that they can preserve themselves, but they don't have to bother with that costly venom production. Now, blue lined octopus and all the blue ringed octopus do have venom. It's not something you want to mess with. Uh, and so those big bright spots are, are really useful to tell you to back off. Um, this is the Pacific blue, blue ringed octopus. This is the one that I think most people are familiar when you think of blue ringed octopus. These are found a little bit further north uh, of Australia, um, continuing all the way up towards Japan. And they have these really, really stark blue rings and they flash. They're able to change the fluorescence in these and flash. So really, really strong defense mechanism there. So some of those strategies we're seeing better, but they're really not using that because first they're going to camouflage, then they're going to move away, then they're going to show you a bright color, and then if they have to, they'll use their venom. So that just shows you how far down the chain venom is. Uh, so I hope that makes you feel a little bit safer when you're moving through Australia, um, because they really don't want to use it. The other thing that we see in the ocean, I wanted to point out this lovely leafy sea dragon, because I think this is one of the coolest examples that I've seen of camouflage. The leafy sea dragon is related to our seahorse, uh, it's related to our weedy sea dragon and our pipefish, and it has grown these amazing physical uh, processes really, this like beautiful skin covering that resembles the kelp in which they're found. We find these guys often on the southern coast of Australia uh, and they're really quite hard to see. I wanted to show you a little video, and it should show up for you, um, of what they look like in the water. So this was recorded down in South Australia. And just have a look in the center, just a little bit to the right, and you can see that weedy sea dragon blending in really well with that kelp, um, and also moving with the current of the water. And so by mimicking this, they're much less likely to be observed. Uh, and that's a really, really good and passive defense that a lot of animals will use. I think camouflage is, is probably the most known, most successful and easily selected for uh, defense strategy that we see. Uh, because if we don't see them, then we're not gonna eat them. So uh, the leafy sea dragon is just a really beautiful exaggeration of that effect. The fact that that has grown and evolved over time to be so, so complicated as a physical structure uh, just so that it, it can blend in with its environment. I think that's pretty special. So I want to pull you up out of the ocean and uh, up onto the nice red earth that I think Australia is pretty well known for. Uh, and so taking us a little bit further into the center, into the outback, uh, some of the lizards that I'm going to talk about are found all over Australia, um, but pretty commonly I'll see them more and more when I'm in those desert environments, also because it's more visible. Uh, so there's less, less ground cover, so I'm able to spot these guys pretty often. They like to sunbake on the road, so that's something I'm always looking out for when I drive, and I'll drive past these guys and they'll sometimes snap at me at the edge of their car because they think I'm a big threat. Um, they're really, really beautiful. So the first one we have is the lovely frill necked lizard. The frill necked lizard is going to use a bunch of strategies. This is a frill necked lizard on a uh, just a mountain ash tree. 
and you can see it blends in really well. If I wasn't looking for it, I probably wouldn't be able to see it. And so camouflage, again, is that really easy, really passive, I don't have to do anything uh, defense strategy. But the main one that the frill neck lizard does is it really tries to amplify its size. Now it's in the name, it kind of gives the game away, uh, but the frill neck lizard is able to expand that frill that you can see folded on its neck and appear much, much larger. You can think of how we're taught to escape from you know, a grizzly bear or something, open your jacket and look really big. And the frill neck lizard has figured out how to do that. And so this is a lovely frill neck lizard displaying that beautiful frill. This takes a little bit more energy, right, rather than just being camouflaged. But if it's feeling threatened, it's going to flare up this really big frill. And it's also got a lot more colour on it. And again, that colour is a really startling reminder to back off. The mouth opens very wide and the, the centre of the mouth is always this really bright yellow. And it kind of looks like an eye as well. And so using eyes is a really good strategy to ward off a lot of predators. So for our frill neck lizards, they may come across snakes, but a lot of their predation naturally would be aerial predators. So we're talking our birds of prey, our raptors, we're talking our eagles and our hawks and our falcons. And so having this big eye staring back at them can be a really good defense um, away from anything that's coming in to swoop at them. Uh, it makes you think twice before you, you chop down on this for, for a bit of food. And the other lizard that we have, which follows a similar vein, uh, is the shingleback lizard, also called uh, the two-headed lizard. And you can see in this picture, a bit of an old picture from my field partner, Mitch, um, but you can have a look. It looks like it does have two heads. So you can see uh, the one in the center of the screen, you can see some little eyes. So that is its true head. And then its tail has grown to look like another head. And so if threatened or when it's resting, the shingleback lizard will just present its tail. The tail is where it keeps all of its fat reserves. This is where it's going to store that energy for when it needs it. And it would much rather get a bite to the tail than then can come around and bite whoever's biting the tail or um, just lose a bit of that tail rather than lose something very crucial like, like the face and the brain. So um, that's a really neat adaption to that but they also have another adaption and we come back to that blue color and so when we think of our shingleback lizard um they're they're so beautiful i love them uh they're very relaxed they spend a lot of their time plodding around pretty slowly and they just have this passive defense of looking like their tail is their head but if you do manage to startle them you will see a bright blue tongue in the center and so this is a shingleback showing off that really blue tongue and that really pink mouth. Again, it is just like a startling display. It is just something that makes you think twice enough that either you back off or the lizard has time to retreat. The blue tongue in the shingleback is related, if you've heard of, if you know our Australian lizards, the blue tongue lizard. And so this is the blue tongue lizard. Um, this was taken on expedition in Southern Australia, and this is by one of our guests, Ed. I uh, got this beautiful quick photo of a blue tongue lizard flashing that blue tongue. So uh, they are very closely related um, and have that same defense where they can flick this bright blue and it tells you to think twice. Now, the other place I wanna pull you is one that you may not think necessarily uh, would have quite as strong a defense as it does. Uh, so we're coming down to Tasmania, Tasmania, Lutruwita, the southern state and island state of Australia, uh, is home to an, a number of, of marsupials. And it's not necessarily known for a lot of big predators. The big predators that we do see here, um, sorry, I'll just check that my laptop is still charging. It is not, excuse me. There we go. Don't want to lose you. <laughs> um, so we see a lot of uh, a lot of herbivores grazing on these large grass plains in Tasmania that are pretty comfortable, but there are a couple of threats. 
we see some really big eagles. We see our wedge tail eagle. They will take uh, some of the smaller marsupials. They'll take our little patty melons. Um, we do see a couple of snakes down here. It's starting to get colder, so we see fewer snakes. Um, but we are starting to see the introduction of foxes and cats as well. Those cats are feral cats and those foxes are feral foxes. Um, there are not many cases of foxes in Tasmania, but there's been a couple of pictures here and there. Um, so if they were to move down onto the main, uh, onto Tasmania, it would be a, a serious threat because there isn't that natural predator on the ground necessarily. We used to have the Tasmanian tiger. And so our animals have created a unique way. And so uh, this is our lovely wombat. And I think the wombat is a very adorable brick of muscle that you wouldn't expect uh, to have a pretty strong defense mechanism. But it's probably one of the most um, unknown and effective defense mechanisms that I quite like. They're absolutely adorable. If you do come to Australia with us, we often go to Butterong, um, which is a rehabilitation center and any young orphaned wombats actually need cuddles until they're two. Uh, so it's a really good opportunity to hug a wombat. Once they turn two, they get really, they call it the terrible twos and they don't want to be near you. They'll start to be uh, a lot more uh, head buddy and, and try and get away from you. Uh, but until they're two, they need that comfort of uh, being with mum, really. So these guys, they just eat grass. They just eat grass. Uh, they dig burrows. They live about their peaceful life on the beautiful sides of the Alpine Hills in Tasmania. Um, found also on the mainland. Uh, but they also have these beautiful burrows. The burrows are very much the size of the wombat. The wombat's designed to dig these burrows. Um, the pouch where they keep their young faces backwards so that when they dig this pouch, uh, they're not putting dirt straight into their young face. Uh, and so there are some uh, cute little shots you can imagine uh, of the backside of a wombat and a little baby wombat sticking out underneath. So if you have a look at the back, this is Greg's photo. You can see there's a darker patch of colouring on the back of this wombat and you can see almost like a, a straighter line down the back side. So the back is where that wombat has been rubbing when it goes into the burrow. So the burrow is really quite a tight uh, channel for the wombat and that is on purpose. And then that back side actually has a really stiff solid plate made of fascia and it's like you could knock on it like a door, it actually knocks, uh, is a solid plate on the back there. So if a wombat is feeling threatened, it's just gonna turn its back on you. Uh, but if it's feeling really threatened, it's gonna make its way into its burrow. Um, and it's gonna use this back plate. This back plate is consistent with its closest relative, the koala. Um, so we can see a lovely joey young koala here. Uh, and it has a cartilage plate as well on the backside and that helps it to rest against trees because they'll sit there for 20, 22 hours a day just snapping and then slowly eating. And so that helps them sit on the trees. But for the wombat, uh, it is a defensive barrier. So they can come into this burrow and you can imagine, let's say for an example, a big feral cat is chasing after a wombat. This wombat's gonna go into one of its many openings. It's going to have its backside exposed. It's gonna be harder to get any uh, purchase onto this wombat, but it's also gonna drop its legs. It's gonna sink down onto a squat and it's gonna wait until that animal is pushing its head in that new opening, trying to get all the way to the front, the head, the vulnerable part of that wombat. And when that head is there, that wombat is gonna stand up with all of its force. And they are so strong. They are just a ball of muscle that they can actually crush the skull of a predator with that back plate against the top of their burrow. It is very intense. And I just think it's like, a crazy adaption that this fuzzy little cuddly grass eating marsupial has adapted to really defend itself. Um, that's a really physical structure. So there's a lot of different adaptions that come through um, in this space and I think 
we start, start to see the extremes of that and we can see how they relate to uh, the specific predators they have. But I think it's also important for us as travellers uh, to be aware of some of these strategies when we go to new places so that these animals don't feel threatened in the first place. That's ideal. But if they're starting to show those defensive behaviours, we back off. We give them their space. Um, so there's usually more uh, than one strategy. Starting with the least energy costly, things that are passive, things like colour or, or uh, camouflage, they're going to be really easy uh, to maintain throughout your life. You don't have to keep putting energy into them versus the really, really costly ones like strong movements or uh, using that venom. So we can recognise those behaviours, we can give that animal space and, and we're here to visit, we're here to share that space. So I hope that gives you just a little bit of an insight into some of those strategies that we see in Australia. Um, there's a lot that we see and I think if you start to look around wherever you call home, uh, you'll start to see how animals interact with each other, how they interact with different species and recognise some of these patterns of behaviour and I think that's a uh, a really cool way for us to start to speak the language of, of a lot of the animals that we share our home with um, and, and really just bring it back to that mutual respect as well. So uh, maybe see you on the next adventure. I'd love to take you down to Australia. This is our newer itinerary here of our ultimate Australia trip um, where we go all the way up to the Dane Tree. We go out to the Great Barrier Reef where you may see your blue ringed octopus all the way down to Tasmania where we see our uh, wombats and there are weedy sea dragons off the coast, up to the outback where we see all of our beautiful lizard species and Kangaroo Island as well. That's where the weedy sea dragon really likes that coast along there. Um, uh, and then finishing in Adelaide. So uh, I hope you got a little bit of an insight there. And if you have any questions, feel free to jump in and, and ask anything a little bit more specific. There's a, there's a lot to dive in with defensive strategies, uh, but thank you. All right, thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some questions now. So what is the average weight and length of the male and female wombats? Do they differ in size greatly? Uh, they don't differ that greatly in size between male and female. And I'm actually just gonna cheat a little bit and um, put it into pounds for you uh, because all of my things are in kilos. <laughs> but I think it'd be a little bit better in in pounds um, they are really dense we kind of know of them as uh, just blocks of muscle so it's uh, about 50 to 90 pounds of just dense wombat um, and they're about three and a half feet long um, and yeah you don't want to you don't want to piss off a wombat. I think if it came hurtling towards you, uh, they're, they're really quite strong, quite heavy. I've held uh, a one-year-old, really, and, you know, you're going to get tired arms pretty quickly. So I can imagine when they're fully grown, uh, when they get into that 90 power range. They're pretty, pretty impressive creatures. Is Australia the only place that you're going to find a wombat? Yes. Uh, wombats are native to Australia. Uh, a lot of the marsupials in the world are generally native to Australia. We see a little bit more in Southeast Asia. We have the opossum, which is the only marsupial in North America. Uh, and we see some around the rest of the world, but the highest density and the highest diversity of our marsupials, including our wombat, are in Australia. Do we know if uh, foxes were brought to Tasmania or are they native? Uh, foxes are introduced to Australia in general. Uh, they were introduced with European settlers only in the past couple of hundred years, um, now making them uh, adapt to their sixth continent. They're found on six of the seven continents, excluding Antarctica, and they've done really well. So in Australia, we didn't have that many native predators in that sort of prey range on the ground. Um, and so with the introduction of foxes and feral cats, uh, they have been playing uh, quite a devastating role as predators 
two species that were normally defending against aerial predation or against our dingoes. And our dingoes were introduced about 5,000 years ago, but they fill a natural role now because they've been there long enough. To Tasmania, the foxes uh, came over a couple of times and were eradicated pretty quickly because they know from the mainland what a threat they pose to, to a lot of our species that are quite vulnerable to that. Um, every now and then an image kind of comes up um, or potentially a fox that has made it across and that would have to be through human intervention. Um, they can't cross the Bass Strait on their own, uh, but it is something that is closely monitored and it's really nice that Tasmania has far fewer um, feral cats and basically no foxes. And so it is a very important stronghold and conservation area for a lot of our species. Uh, so they can be safer and then reintroduced back into the mainland. So can you talk a little bit about defensive strategies used by the Tasmanian devil? Okay, yeah. So the Tasmanian devil is uh, one of our little predators on in Tasmania. Um, they are quite small. They are um, not as fierce as I think they get their reputation to be. Um, they have a really loud screech that does sound something like the devil in the woods, which is where they originally got their name from. Uh, but they are mainly scavengers. So they're mainly scavenging uh, kills from other animals like our quolls or from our big birds of prey, um, also from roadkill as well. They'll scavenge on that. Uh, they will fight quite a lot with each other in terms of competition. They will go out each other's faces, and that's where um, anyone knows about their, the Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease has been quite devastating because they are always biting each other, and that's a social interaction as well as defensive. In terms of defensive strategies, they are well camouflaged, they are nocturnal, uh, so they are more active at night, and they are mainly black. They have a couple of white markings that just depend on the individual, they're quite small. Uh, so by being black in a dark environment, they're generally gonna blend in quite well. Uh, but they don't have many big natural predators. Uh, it really is gonna be calling, um, camouflage and just running away really, if anything is big enough to take them. They're more camouflaged against trying to get food and stuff like that as well. So yeah, a couple of different strategies. So if I'm going to come down and visit on a trip with NatHab, am I going to see a wombat and a Tasmanian devil and a kangaroo and all of these different animals? Uh, I never like to guarantee wildlife because we like to get out there and see what we can see. However, we are very much known for seeing all of those animals. Uh, <laughs> we have a huge population of kangaroos. Um, that's an easy spot even when I'm just visiting my mom and camera. I'm going to see kangaroos on the lawn. Um, the Tasmanian devils is not something that we're likely to see in the wild. I would be so excited if we did and we do go spotlighting. We hear them occasionally, uh, but we go to two uh, wildlife conservation uh, rehabilitation centres for the Tasmanian devils. So we go to Devils at Cradle in Cradle Mountain in Tasmania uh, and then we also see them in Bunurong as well. So we have the opportunity to see them. They are a breeding population so that we can release them into a safe environment once we have a safe environment from this disease, which we're really, really close on, like years, if not months close on, which is really exciting. So watch that space. Um, and wombats, I see quite consistently down in Tasmania. And then we do see them on the mainland as well, which is something that we really like to spot and see on the mainland but they're really quite comfortable down in Tasmania just with that less predation pressure. Um, yeah, you're pretty guaranteed to see all of them. <laughs> Does that include snakes? Uh, we do sometimes see snakes. I have a chat every time I take people out to see snakes. Uh, snakes, if we're gonna see them, we're gonna see them when they're basking generally. Uh, so generally they hear us well before we see them. Uh, and they move away because again, they don't want to bother with us. We're huge, we're not a food for them. They don't want to deal with it. Um, but they do like to bask and get that heat and get that energy 
throughout the day on the roads on big flat rocks. And so often we see them from a distance uh, and that's something that we can see. We can appreciate them as the beautiful creatures that they are uh, and we can give them their space or usually they, they'll move off as well if there's anything coming towards them. Uh, so we do see snakes. Uh, I will point out some cool spiders if you come. I will avoid cool spiders if you don't want to talk about cool spiders, but we have some really beautiful things there and it's a really important part of our ecosystem. Is are there a lot of uh, native animals uh, that are tagged for research purposes? Uh, there are a few different programs. I'm assuming by tagged we're talking like radio tracking potentially. Um, we have some radio tracked animals depending on the project. Um, the reason that anyone would be radio tracking animals or tagging animals for that would be to have an idea of where they're moving and how they're recovering. So I know that after the bushfires, there are a number of koalas that were tagged uh, so that we could see where they were moving and where they were getting their food from. Because so much of the area was burnt, we wanted to make sure that there was food available for them. Um, so there will be a few, but often they're taken off or they purposely drop off after a short period of time. Uh, I don't know that I've, personally seen any wild animals in Australia that have been tagged. Um, I have gone out on research projects where I'm actually tracking certain individuals, uh, but it really depends on the project and the location, so it does depend. Um, some birds will get banding just to look at different populations, so I know some of our little penguins in the really northern populations will have a little ringed band around their ankle um, just to tell us uh, how many there are. So if we see them again and we see, uh, a, say we see, we banned five of them and then we let them go and then we see five penguins and only one of them is banned, then we assume that there's a population of 25 because we caught five back and one of them is banned, then we think that that population is that much bigger, um, things like that. So there are different strategies that are used for various projects. So just huge diversity of, of projects that go on in Australia um, as with around the world, but it's not often that we see a lot of different tagging. Yeah. At what times of year does NatHab run trips down to Australia? Uh, so the season for Australia runs from about September all the way through to April and May, um, depending on the itinerary. Uh, so it really is more or less a year round. Often it's a quiet time during the Australian winter, often because a lot of people are exploring the Northern Hemisphere summer. Uh, and so it's not that animals are more active during the summer or the winter. That's just when uh, we're all available to come down. That's when I'll be going down in a couple of weeks to guide for Australia. Um, and yeah, so it is quite a long season and those dates will shift year to year depending on operators, um, but it's also a newer season for us and we're really excited to continue to expand that season. So if there's certain dates you're after, it's definitely something you should write in and we'll see what we can do for you. <laughs> Great. Well, unfortunately, that's the last question that we do have for today. So I'd like to throw it back to you for some closing comments. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you so much for your amazing questions and your insightful comments. If you want to leave any other questions or comments, um, even as we're wrapping up, I do read them all and can reach out for any specifics or uh, if you have any ideas of what you want to hear about in the future, uh, you can let us know. But I hope that you guys have had a little bit of an insight into how some of the Australian animals are looking after themselves and how we can help to look after them in that same space. Thanks. Nikki, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.